decade of disappointment, the DC Breeze is flying to championship weekend. I love where we're at, and it's time to peak. We're in the position we want to be. Now it's about winning championships, right? One more shot to come down and prove who we are. We got a lot of potential this year. We're going to work as hard as we can, put in the hours, and see what we can do. And the four semifinalists, Carolina Flyers, DC Breeze, Minnesota Windchill, and Seattle Cascades. <laughs> A mighty memorable divisional weekend is in the books in the Ultimate Frisbee Association. And the four semifinalists are championship weekend bound. The Carolina Flyers, the DC Breeze, the Minnesota Windchill, and the Seattle Cascades with the stunner of the weekend here in Salt Lake. We welcome you to the site of championship weekend where we all thought the shred would be playing, but that will not be happening on August 23rd. Welcome to our championship weekend preview, everybody. Ian Toner, Evan Leppler. Wow, two road teams win in thrilling fashion. How do you try to recap this wild weekend that was? It's impossible to do in just a few seconds. I think I had so much faith in the favorites that I was just that much more surprised in the upsets that took place. There's no question Carolina could have done it going into that game and they pulled things off. There's no question Seattle had the ability and they pulled things off. But the way that they did it and the execution and the strategy with the pressure and the season on the line, just so impressive to me from both of those squads in particular. Yeah, it really comes down to execution and crunch time and just guts and will. And we saw that from the Carolina Flyers, who did not get off to a great start in Atlanta, where the weekend began on Friday night. Hustle led 2-0 and then 10-7, trying to exercise the demons of playoff failures past. But they opened the door slightly, and the Flyers experienced and talented enough barge through. It looked like a really clean and crisp first half from both teams, but in the second half, Carolina's defense, Atlanta's nerves, Carolina's strategy down the stretch, ultimately giving them the upper hand. Who would have thought that they could run out the clock with four minutes and change remaining? Just unbelievable stuff from Ben Snell, Elijah Long and company. 53 consecutive completions to run out the remaining time on the Atlanta hustle season. And the Flyers for the third time in four years, for the fourth time in franchise history, are heading to championship weekend. We'll talk about their semifinal opponent in a minute. But let's continue chronologically with the East Final. And the D.C. Breeze winning their first East Division title. Got a little hairy late, but the Breeze got off to a good start and really were in control of the East Final from wire to wire. I'm just so impressed at how this group has improved because I saw this team open their season right here on this very field back in April and not really look like a championship contender. Yes, they played Salt Lake to within a few goals, but it was clear that they lacked the D-line offensive consistency, but they've added D-line firepower. They've gotten more guys back into the fold. They're executing at such a high clip, and who can take the disc away from that O-line right now? That group is playing with such efficiency. They didn't let any nerves get the better of them. They got things done against Boston and brought Jeff Babbitt's heroic season to an end. Incredible stuff from Lauren Boyle building that team. Obviously, Daryl Stanley left the team culture in a pretty good spot, but a different flavor this year from a leadership perspective. Alex Crew, too, yeah. coaching up that defense and getting the most out of everyone on that roster. Yeah, so the Breeze will face the Minnesota Windchill in the semifinals at Championship Weekend, a Minnesota team that returns to the Final Four for the second year in a row. It was a, a, a tighter game in the midway portion, but kind of like DC, Minnesota got off to a pretty good start, was in control and pulled away late against the Madison Radicals. Yeah, Madison surged back a little bit. They were down 16-8 at one point, got it back to 16-12, but ultimately, Madison's Achilles heel all season long has been its offense, its ability to execute consistently and smoothly. We know that its defense can rattle off breaks, especially when it gets in rhythm, but that offense just couldn't find its footing double-digit turnovers. That group just couldn't get it done for them this weekend. So Ben Feldman will lead the windshield back to championship weekend. And then in the West Final here in Salt Lake City, the Shred were the top seed and the favorite and the reigning division champ and the regular season champs. But none of that mattered because Salt Lake 
encountered a pretty fearless Seattle Cascades team. Spencer Lofink and Aaron Wolf got the offense off to a phenomenal start, and they played with more energy down the stretch. Well, you got a great quote from Lucas Ambrose before this game talking about how scared Seattle played when they faced off against Seattle in the regular season finale here. Against Salt Lake. I beg your pardon, against Salt Lake here. And that group from Seattle tonight showed absolutely no fear. The offense was fighting through physicality and hitting tight windows all night long. The defense was aggressive on the mark, unafraid to challenge receivers in the deep space. They had the strategy, they had the execution, and goodness, they did it all against the shred decks. This was an imposing home crowd that brought the energy all game long came down to the final sequence. We're standing right near the spot where Will Selfridge threw a hammer, unfortunately, into the ground with a chance to tie the game. How sweet that must have felt for Garrett Martin, the former Shredhead, and so many other guys on the Cascades. Before we move on to the semifinal matchups, a thought on the Salt Lake Shred. They go 10-2, and two, but we talked about how their efficiency overall had lapsed compared to last year. It had regressed and just a little too sloppy over the course of the final. Seattle capitalized in a really kind of disappointing, crushing way to end their season. This is kind of a cop-out perspective, but I think it was equal parts Salt Lake not hitting easy throws and choosing resets that they didn't need to hit and also Seattle's defense. Because in the second half, that defense started to take the ball away. They'd only gotten one block in the first half. Khalif El Salam, hand block on the mark. Lucas Ambrose woke up, got a great block over there on that sideline. Equal parts, Salt Lake giving it away and Seattle taking it away down the stretch. No question about it. So the championship weekend field for Ultimate Frisbee Association's Final Four is set. And the semifinal matchups will begin with D.C. and Minnesota. First ever meeting between the Breeze and the Windchill. You had a good line, the battle of the elements. The Breeze certainly the favorite, but we saw Minnesota play really well on their home field at championship weekend. And they, they certainly have unfinished business in the semifinals after what happened last year in the final seconds against the Shred. Well, Ben Feldman, Max Lawnchamp and company, they absolutely know how to turn games into rock fights. And it may not be pretty, it may not be the most elegant way to win games, but they've stolen so many defensive tactics from Tim DeBile and other leaders in the Central Division. That defense can be an imposing presence that has a bunch of tricks up its sleeve. The question is, will they, able to, will they be able to execute against an offense that's so talented in the way that DC's offense is? And frankly, can they be as efficient that DC, as DC's D-line offense is? Because that group is just on another level right now as well. It's obviously early, but give me a player for the wind chill that you think is going to be really important in the matchup against DC. I think Brian Vinoka is someone who defies the laws of physics and aging. He gets better with age. He's getting sharper decision-making and is somehow playing some of the best ultimate of his career. I hope he doesn't take that as a slight. But his ability to contribute consistently on both sides of the disc, wherever his team needs him, is an absolute game changer. And we've seen them turn to him time and again this season. And we, we know that DC's D-line is pretty talented as well. Minnesota's going to need a good stabilizing performance from Will Brandt in the backfield. Brandt has been a guy who's just continued to ascend the Donovan Award winner, a D3 college national champ, along with Gordon Larson, his windshield teammate at St. Olaf. It, the windshield are going to need to hold against the Breeze if they're going to win. They're going to need to hold relatively consistently, and Brandt, along with Josh Klain in the backfield, going to be a really important factor in that uh, pursuit. What about the D.C. Breeze? I mean, they've tried to get to the semifinals for a long time. They had New York in their way. The Boston Glory slayed that dragon, and then D.C. took down Jeff Babbitt in Boston, so the Breeze are headed to their first Final Four. Who do you got your eye on for D.C.? I mean, the Breeze have a handful of Team USA and other international-level talents, but I'm keeping my eye on Thomas Edmonds. He's another one of those guys who can slot into either line, who's elevated his game, and is someone who can command 
and quarterback with poise and confidence, and he can also shut down his matchup and get high-flying blocks. I don't mean to be blinded by the highlight plays, but just his ability to impact so many different phases and lines of the game is something that few other players in this league can do. And obviously, DC's offense has had a special season, the highest completion percentage ever, the fewest turnovers per game ever. Rowan McDonald may not be the most important guy on the offense anymore, but he has worked so long for this moment. The former UFA MVP, you could see the emotion on his face as the final seconds ticked off in the East Final. And I got my eye on Rowan to perhaps do something special at Championship Weekend as he tries to get DC two more wins in their first championship. So that's the first semi, the chill and the breeze. The second semi, I'm not sure what the order is going to be, but I would think that Carolina-Seattle would be the night game. We'll see if that pans out. The Carolina Flyers, no stranger to championship weekend. They won the 21 title, knocking down the New York Empire in Washington, D.C. after a thrilling win over the Breeze, who were the favorite in that quarterfinal. Who are you looking at for the Flyers to, to really be Im important in the matchup against Seattle? By the way, another matchup we've never seen before. I got my eye on Mr. Front Cone, Anders Jungst. Just a power cutter to the nth degree. Turned in an unbelievable performance with the season on the line last night against Atlanta. He is an engine of that offense. He is not the only piece. Of course, Alan LaViolette, Elijah Long, and others are going to be involved. Jacob Fairfax elevated his play last time they were in a championship game. But Durs is playing at such a high, powerful level. And you can put any kind of matchup on him, but who's going to beat him in a five-yard race to the cone? He's got that powerful first step. He can get them out of high stall situations. He's the guy I'm keeping my eye on going into Who the can beat him to the weekend. cone? Sorry, to, uh, maybe Lucas Ambrose. I don't know. We'll talk about him okay. in a second. Yeah. You, you mentioned all the all the guys on the Flyers' offense. You didn't mention Toby Brooks. He's obviously an important youngster as well. How could I forget? An important youngster on the defense, Christian Belis. Kid out of UNC Wilmington. He might be the first Wilmington guy I've ever liked. This, this kid plays with – sorry, Jack. Sorry, JD, but it's true. Belis plays with unbelievable energy. He basically got the game-saving block. That, that set up the string of completions in the win over Atlanta. So we'll see. I mean, he, he has, as the season has gone along, become more confident, and the team just has limitless confidence in what he can do on the field defensively. Seattle's going to be the underdog in this matchup against the Flyers, but they were the underdog at Zions Bank Stadium in the West, and that didn't bother in the West Final, and that didn't bother them at all. The Cascades are playing with house money, but they're also – a really dangerous, scary team. This is a team that somehow rises to the occasion despite having not really been in that moment before. Sure, khalif has been there, Tommy Lee's been there. They got a few guys who have been in this setting, but the majority of their roster, this is their first deep playoff run. A guy that I'm keeping my eye on, it's no secret that Lucas Ambrose is somebody that Mike Denardis and company are gonna have to literally game plan against. Leading the lead in blocks, league in blocks for the second consecutive season. He found a way to impact the game profoundly tonight with scores to convert breaks, to convert O prime holds, and also to get blocks. The Carolina offense is going to have to keep him out of the throwing lanes and not let him hunt if they're going to want to look to convert efficiently. Ambrose and Khalif, along with Garrett Martin, are the faces of the Seattle Cascades team. Mark Mudios, Shane Worthington are veterans. Spencer Lofink is not a name that a lot of folks around the league know. He hasn't really had too many breakout performances on the national stage, but he had five first quarter assists in the West Final against Salt Lake. And he just continued to be steady. He's got size as a handler. He's got savvy. He got his team out of tricky situations numerous times. You know Mike Denardis and the Flyers defense is going to throw a lot of wacky stuff against him. If the Cascades are going to have a chance against Carolina, which I think they do, but they're going to need Spencer Lofink to play well. It wouldn't hurt if Christian Foster comes back as well. He's a veteran of many big games. He was un, unable to play in the West Final due, due, due to an injury, but hopefully for the Cascade's sake, he'll be back for the semifinals, which are less than two weeks away. Championship weekend 2024, different than we expected in a variety of ways, but it's D.C. and Minnesota. 
and it's Atlanta and Seattle. And remember, Carolina what, and Seattle. It, it, I got you, buddy. You got me. Apologies <laughs> to the folks in the ATL. Perhaps wishful thinking, but uh, I'm I'm flying back to North Carolina, so that's I got to be nice to my to my dudes with the Flyers. Remember what happened the last time Seattle made championship weekend in shocking fashion? They shocked the home crowd and they made it to the championship game. And they've already shocked the home crowd one round earlier here. This I, I, I'm with you. They have the talent. They have the pieces. And coming into this game, I was skeptical if they had the depth and the discipline and the poise to be able to pull something like this off. But this was a statement victory. I know that's a cliche that gets used a lot in sports, but after not really getting many quality, true signature wins over the course of this season, to upset Salt Lake on their home field, uh, that says a lot to me. Championship weekend coming up August 23rd and 24th. Get your tickets. Hope to see you right back here at Zions Bank Stadium for the wind chill and the breeze and the Flyers and the Cascades. Thanks for watching our Divisional Weekend Recap and Championship Weekend Preview. Ian Toner, see you Championship Weekend, my friend. Can't wait. For Ian, I'm Evan. Thanks for watching. Good night.